Hey guys, it's me Tomplex here, back at you guys with another comic book video. Today I'm going to be discussing my full review and how Todd McFarlane changed the game of comics with Spider-Man. The book I have is Spider-Man from 1990, which started, in, this run started in 1990. This is collecting all of Todd McFarlane's collection with the one exception of X-Force number three, illustrated and written by Rob Liefeld. Now, I just want to start off by saying Todd McFarlane change the idea of Spider-Man forever. The basic idea was still there. Great power comes with great responsibility. The uncle dies. All the great characters it still follows the main storyline of Spider-Man, but they but he changed it artistically because at the time, Spider-Man artistically was not in a good place. The webs were not good. They just felt like one black thread that just shot out of his wrist or when he shot like a web that spread out, it was just four lines and that were cross hatched and it looks like barbed wire and it did not look as sexy. Marvel did not want him to go down to the Spider-Man department because at the time he was working on Incredible Hulk and also doing covers for Marvel. They told him don't go in the Spider-Man department because he kept changing things. He kept looking at things in a different way. They And what he heard, which is what I also hear when they were telling him not to, was make it boring. When he went down to the Spider-Man department, it was a mess artistically and so, he joined on to Spider-Man, which was at the time being written by David Michelinie. During that time, it also led way to the birth of Venom when he joined on. Spider-Man at the time was in the black suit and he said, I don't want the black suit, get rid of it. I want put him back in the red and blue. How do I do that in a way that makes sense? And, Tom and David Michelinie, I think was like, we need a monster. And so he's like, here, I'll give you some drawings of what I want, like of the black suit. Because the black suit was originally alive, but then he got rid of it and then got an entirely new suit made out of UMF, or Unstable Molecule Fabrics, made by the Fantastic Four. Venom got to MJ just to get to Peter, and MJ was terrified by, and MJ was terrified by this, and so she asked him to throw out the black suit after his first fight with Venom in Spider-Man 300. And that was a big issue, because... 300 full issues of Spider-Man, that's insane. Starting from 1968, I I'm not 100% sure. Future me put up when the first issue of Spider-Man came out in Amazing Fantasy. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, does whatever a spider can. Spins a web, any size, catches seeds, just like flies. Look out, here comes a Spider-Man. Spider-Man at the time was focusing too much on the man part. It just looks like a guy, a gymnast who was swinging from a rope. And so he decided for th his version of Spider-Man to focus more on the spider part, or like a bug. Like his body would be in different positions. He con his webs were different. It was just beautiful. His eyes were big, like actual bugs. He changed the webbing on the suit, made it more detailed, like an actual spider web shrouding his suit. And it was just amazing. And I instantly fell in love with the art style. I actually first heard of Tom McFarlane's art from Spawn. And it's by far one of my favorite comics to this day. The, the entirety of the Spawn series. It just passed issue 350, Record Breaker 350, longest running series for a single creator-owned comic, overseen and sometimes worked on by him. He still works on it. Every single detail of the Spawn universe he works on because he truly cares about that character. It's his baby, and I appreciate that. Continuing on from my point, Marvel was not happy with what Todd was doing. He was like, no, 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 this, this is how it's supposed to be. It's like, why can't I make appendages come out of the pages? Why can't I stretch panels across the page? Why can't I make them overlap? Why can't I take the character out of the page and make it feel three-dimensional? Because a lot of comics at the time, they were very flat and it was not very sexy and it was just very bland, if I haven't already said that. When he was doing it, Spider-Man was suddenly starting to sell and and that was because of Todd. Michelinie did a really great, David Michelinie did a really great job as a writer. I still love his writing, especially with Spider-Man and Iron Man. I love it. But the art style was not quite as sexy. And Todd changed that. And so he made it look beautiful. He made the webs feel like they were being shot out at the camera. He made the poses look dynamic and epic. It was beautiful. And when they told him, no, 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 after Spider-Man, he was like, all right, then I'll quit. And he's like, no, 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 no. And they were like, no, 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 wait, how about this? People seem to like your Spider-Man stuff. We'll give you 
a new starting series because they already had like three Spider-Man titles at the time about to let Todd make his own, which was going to be a fourth. And they had The Amazing Spider-Man, which was the series that was already being worked on. Uh, Web of Spider-Man. Third title was Spectacular Spider-Man. Then they were about to give Todd a fourth, which was just called Spider-Man. They were like, we'll let you do your own series. And it's like, and he said, you're going to give me permission to write, even though I've never written before, you're going to let me draw every issue. You're going to let me have full control over this. And they're like, yep. And they still tried to sleep, tried to sneak their way in and try to tell him like, no, 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 no. no. But he was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then they finally published issue one of Spider-Man, which was chapter one of five of Torment. And that book is one of the top three biggest selling comic books ever. Two and a half million copies sold. Still one of the most sold comics to this day. The next was um, New Mutants 98, which was illustrated by Rob Liefeld, which was the first appearance of Deadpool. So the number one is X-Men number one, Jim Lee. They were selling, but Marvel still wasn't happy. And so Todd just kept going and going and going and going. And he continued on with the series for 14 issues. And then he took a break after number 15. And then Eric Larson and David Michelin took over that one. And then Rob Liefeld, I think, was doing a tie, was going to do a tie-in with it. And they did. It was, X it was at the end of X-Force number two, Spider-Man came along when... Black Tom Cassidy and Juggernaut just blew up the upper half of the World Trade Center. And he was just swinging by and he sees this and he goes to help and that leads right into Spider-Man number 16. And I think Todd, I, I think Rob asked Todd to do that one issue as a time because he loved how he did Spider-Man. And then that went right in X-Force number three, illustrated by Rob Liefeld. And that is basically the timeline of Todd McFarlane's Spider-Man. And then... They broke away and then went to him and then gathered on a bunch of people. Todd basically sold them the idea. He didn't even ask them if they wanted to come on. He just sort of talked about what they were doing. And they were like, can I come? And those people, I think, were Jim Valentino, Rob Liefeld, Jim Lee, uh, Will Sportatio, uh, Mark Silvestri, Eric Larson, and a couple others. I forgot who they were. Other than Todd, you pretty much got it all right. But Tom McFarlane was sort of the elite. Uh, well, they weren't. There wasn't really a leader. They were all sort of like in it together, and they founded their own company, Image Comics, and they sold some pretty epic issues. They made uh, Eric Larson had that cool dragon sh uh, comic run. Uh, Jim Valentino, I think, it did Shadowhawk. Rob Liefeld did Young Blood. Tom McFarlane did Spawn. Mark Silvestri did something. Everyone got to do something, and they got to talk about it, but they never interfered in each other's works. It was their own thing, and they could do what they wanted with it. And those issues and those books sold immensely, because it was what the fans wanted, and it was what people were expecting out of comic books. Because it was starting to get bland, it needed an upgrade. That is basically my rant of the timeline of. I, what I think occurred. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments below, and I'll reply with by apologizing with any mistakes I made in the timeline, but I, this is what I think happened based on what I've heard. On to this. So this starts out with the five chapter part, which is called Torment. This voodoo witch, which I think is what she's called in the comics. I forgot what her real name is. Her name is Calypso. But she was an ex-lover of Craven the Hunter. When Craven died, and Craven's last hunt, spoiler alert, Craven blows his own head off. She uses dark magic and brings back Doc Connors, the lizard. And Doc Connors has no say in the matter. The lizard is in complete control. The lizard is being controlled by this witch and she just wants Spider-Man dead. There is no reason. There is no reason. She just does it because she wants to. Sometimes evil is just because someone wants to. And that's what we figure out through the course of the story. And this is the most, again, the going on with the, with the title of this run, the most tormented I've ever seen a Peter Parker 
since Craven's last hunt. Since Cra in Craven's last hunt, Craven stole his identity and then did horrible things and buried Peter Parker alive, treated him like an animal, and so Spider Man reacted like an animal. And then Craven knew he was the worthy opponent and was going to be superior to Craven. He could not deal with this and he blew and he shot himself in the head. And the voodoo witch makes Spider Man hallucinate that it is Craven talking to him but then reveals that it is in fact her and she's just torturing him. But it was a great mystery and it shows that sometimes evil doesn't need a reason to be evil. And that's what I enjoyed about it. And it showed Peter Parker's strength. And we didn't, and again, we haven't seen something like that since Craven's Last Hunt. It's heartbreaking and violent, and dark and gritty. And that is exactly what I want it to be. Next up, we got uh, issues five and, uh, we. Issue six and seven, we have something called masks. Hobgoblin has basically gone Jesus freak, causing mass destruction. Spider-Man's investigating and trying to put a stop to this, and then Ghost Rider intervenes and then has to put a stop to go to Hobgoblin's mask and is the anti-hero. During this time, it's Danny Ketch's Ghost Rider, it's not Johnny Blaze. This goes right into the next story, which is perceptions. During this time, Wendigo is up in Canada and he's roaming around and finds the body of a dead child. A reporter stumbles upon it, crashes her car into Wendigo. The body is flying. Wendigo goes off injured. She has reason to believe that this is Bigfoot and is killing children. And it shows that people are willing to believe anything, even the supernatural, just to have things make sense, something new instead of the actual truth. Spider-Man goes up in Canada to investigate, sent by J. John Jameson, well, as Peter Parker. As he's investigating, Wolverine gets involved, because Wolverine and Wendigo, though rivals, are best buds. They have a mutual understanding as animals of the wild. And over time, Logan is, again, being the anti-hero, and... Spider-Man is trying to be the bold heroic and he's questioning whether or not Wolverine was right because during because this is just after the masks storyline with Hobgoblin and Ghost Rider and so he's questioning is this the right thing to do do I have to resort to violence to match with violence over time we find out that is actually a human who did this an inspector of the police and then when the truth finally gets revealed instead of being on the front page it's all the way in page 20 of the newspaper and no one cares because it's not what they want it to be. The second to last story of this run is called Subsidy. A bunch of inbred mole people in the sewers are basically kidnapping homeless people. For what reason? We do not know up until the very end of the first chapter. Spider-Man wants to investigate, but J. Joe and Jameson does not care. He says, what's a few homeless bums? to a newspaper. It's not a good story. Get me a good story. Get me picture. Get me pictures of Spider-Man. So Peter goes to investigate and he try and he follows this person into the sewer, the person who is kidnapping all these people. He tries to go in the sewer, but his color but the colors of his costume are way too bright. And so he has to go to Mary Jane and consult and and console her about using the black costume again. At this point they're still married and still in love with each other. And Mary Jane is against this. Uh and Peter knows I, and Peter says, I know what Venom did to you, but please, I have to figure that out this mystery. I have to stop many more from dying of this. And she says, fine. <laughs> right at the end, we find out all these homeless people are under the reign of Michael Morbius. Morbius, before this, was trying to work with Stephen Strange to cure his vampirism because at this point he's run out of options science won't help him physical therapy won't help him all these things so he figures what will magic uh magic could probably help and it didn't he thinks his vampirism is the only thing that will keep him alive or keep him going so he goes down to this homeless to these homeless people and these homeless people think everyone above is bad but they say we'll bring you the bad people he says only if they are bad, then bring them to me. In the end, he finds out that the homeless people just say all the people up above are bad. And Michael, filled with guilt, runs away in terror after fighting Spider-Man and figuring out that he's just basically committed murder 
to innocence, possibly innocence. And Pierre at the end wonders how far will we go to try and satiate the beast within. But, and he's thinking, I'll talk to Reed Richards on the Fantastic Four, maybe they can help him in some way, shape, or form. The final part of this story is the X-Force tie-in. Basically, this ties in X-Force 2. Black Tom Cassidy comes back and brings back the Juggernaut, and in their rage, they blow up the first half of the first building of the World Trade Center, and, and X-Force gets involved and try to take out Black Tom Cassidy and Juggernaut, and then Spider-Man somehow gets involved. They're trying, they're trying to stop them, and then we meet Gideon, uh, main character in the X-Force storyline of the first 15 issues. Cable guns down Black Tom Cassidy and isn't dead. Deadpool takes Juggernaut and Black Tom Cassidy to his boss, Mr. Tolliver. It's a cool side story if you want a really cool action-packed story. If you want the entire story and want to go in-depth with, with those characters, I suggest you read X-Force Volume 1. They're doing a reprint of that book in December, so... Be on the lookout for that. Pre-order it if you want. You can pre-order it on Amazon, but I totally recommend you read that. Anyways, this is a really cool action-packed book. The stories are wonderful. They really talk about moral issues, and it's filled with great action-packed sequences. If you want blood and gore, if you want punches, people who twist different directions, arms that come out of the page right at you, and a cool side story if you want to continue checking it out. Go check out X-Force Volume 1. But we're not here to talk about X-Force Volume 1. We're here to talk about Spider-Man and Tom McFarlane and how he changed the game. Tom McFarlane changed the game of Spider-Man forever. A lot of people are trying to do what he did, but I don't think... It. And as good as they can do, I feel like the only people who can come close are Eric Larson and the person who illustrated Spider-Man in 2099. And Mark Bagley, too. The art inside is amazing. The story is amazing. Written and illustrated and inked by Todd McFarlane. Not color though, but um, my God, it's beautiful. But if you want something cool, something different from like modern Spider-Man comics or old Spider-Man comics and like an in-between, if you want something epic for Spider-Man, I recommend this, then Eric Larson or Mark Bagley's Spider-Man Omnibus run. Those are just a beautiful runs, beautiful stories. Go check them out. They're totally worth it. Worth every penny. I gotta say, Tom McFarlane Spider-Man, or just Tom McFarlane in general, 20 out of 10, man. Go check it out. Go check out some of his art. There's some pretty epic art. Um, go check out this book. I totally recommend it. Go check out Spawn. Um, they're releasing Compendium 6, which goes all the way to issue 300. Enough of, enough of side chat. This book is beautiful. Go read it. If you want something cool and action-packed with neat storytelling, uh, go, go check out this book. It's pretty epic. Thank you everybody so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. Please make sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Tap the notification bell so you never miss a video from me. And until next week, I will see y'all later. Sayonara.